Hey guys, thanks for joining me for another episode of Talking Sass. So excited to have you for today because we have not one, but two guests, which means pro wrestling historian and author Dan Murphy is going to be on at the very, very end telling us our monthly history lesson. So make sure you stick around because he always has fantastic history to let us know about. So remember, stick to the end, right? Now, before we get to my guest today, of course, I'm gonna tell you about patreon.com. For less than what you spend on a cup of coffee per day, you're gonna get a whole month of exclusives from patreon.com slash sassy And like I said, there is so much great content there. You're gonna love it. So make sure you go and subscribe today. You can also follow me on Instagram and on Twitter at Sassy Steffi. And while you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe and also hit that bell notification. You never know when a special episode might come out. Also, if you are listening in on your favorite podcast platform, make sure you go and give Talking Sass a five-star rating and also leave a review. If you leave a review, who knows? Maybe I might just read it on the air sometime, right? Now on to today's guest. I am so excited to have her on, Amber Nova. You've seen her wrestle on Impact. You've seen her wrestle on NXT. She is just literally a shooting star ready to just burst into the biggest, brightest star ever. And I'm so, exi so excited, excuse me, to have her on. And you know what? What is better than a woman who actually knows her way around a car? I sure wish I did. Well, here she is. This is Amber Nova. here with the one and only Amber Nova. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for taking time out to come on and be a part of the show. Yes, I'm so happy to be on the show. Thank you. I've seen some pretty amazing women. So now I'm part of the collection. Yeah, definitely. And I'm, <laughs> I'm glad I'm getting like this well rounded amount of people too. like I'm getting up and comers like you. I mean, you've been around for about what five years now. But you're still considered up and coming yeah. to me. Like once you get around 10 years, then you're yes. like, okay, now you've been in. Yeah. The you're not really up and coming anymore, even though like everybody knows who Amber Nova is. I mean, you've done so many great things so far, and we're going to be getting into all of that during this podcast. But I want to go back before wrestling and talk to you because I know you used to be an EMT. What made you decide yes. to make uh, EMT? Um, I think I was 19. I was right up about out of high school. I went to college to become an EMT. I just wanted to help people. I wanted to be like a little superhero. I guess I've always had this like little superhero thing about me, like the wrestling. And yeah, I loved being an EMT. I, I didn't have social media. People thought I probably didn't even exist when I first started to come to wrestling and yeah. I had to make social media and everything. But yeah, I left my career job being an EMT in Beaufort, South Carolina, and I come to Orlando with a Nova and a dream. <laughs> That's amazing because I mean, to just leave, like you said, an EMT is a career job. It's not like something you're just gonna be like, oh, I'm tired of it in two months and, and move on to another job. That's something that, you know, you go to school for, you take the time. So what made you decide that Orlando and wrestling was the route that you wanted to go? I would, so I knew Orlando was the destination luckily it was only two states away so it wasn't too far from friends and family though it still gets hectic with schedules I would drive around you know in the ambulance with my partner and I would just talk about wrestling and how I always wanted to, to try it and my partners were so supportive they said go for it you should do it you can always come back and you know come back be an EMT and retire and and you know, I've been watching wrestling since I was a kid, like many people, right? Yeah. Um, Booker T, Goldberg, Sting, Medusa, Luna Vachon, Victoria. I mean, the, the list goes on of all these women I've you know, and men I've watched. And they always had these amazing stories and intensity. I was like, I want to tell my own story. But I never thought like it could happen for someone like me because I didn't look like Trish or Victoria or China, you know? So I'm, I'm much more like a Sasha Banks petite body type so I didn't yeah. think I could do it but then you know then here comes the WWE Performance Center right here in Orlando Florida and I see Bailey and Sasha and Carmella and Paige coming up and I'm like whoa these beautiful young women are not the size of China and they are kicking ass and they're like my age I'm like okay let me let me look into this let me see where if you know I can train I can pay for training I can try and get some experience and 
realistically, I went, I checked out some places and then I decided, okay, I'm going to take the move. And I moved completely alone, just my Nova and me and just started training. And I figured like, if it doesn't work out, you know, I'll know in a certain amount of time, months to a year. And I go back to being an EMT if it doesn't start to work out. And so far, it seems to be working out quite lovely for you. <laughs> it has been. I, yeah. I, I can't, I have to say I'm very grateful for the experiences and the people. I'm very grateful. Awesome. And you mentioned your Nova. I think that that's like <laughs> something that I really want to get into. I don't know much about cars, but I, I mean, obviously you do from everything that you put on social media, your car or something with Nova, besides obviously your, your name there is always incorporated into what you do. What got you into classic cars and cars in general? I'm the daughter of a mechanic. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it. Doug, I was born in Jersey, mom and dad are from Jersey. So my dad, you know, he's always been restoring classic American muscle cars his whole life, including like right now, he's in the middle of restoring a 69 SS Chevelle. So, he had, my dad had this 69 SS Nova growing up. So I guess I always liked Novas because he had this Nova. He would take wherever we moved, he would come with us and he would be restoring it. And uh, yeah, I just, I loved the American muscle. So I was like, all right, my first car, I'm going to get a Nova. And so I've had two 73 Novas actually. Wow. And why did you? The, the second time the year just like coincidence, it happened to be okay. the same year. <laughs> I, I was going to ask, like, is that a specific, like, um, type of Nova or something, but no, it just happened to be a coincidence. It's the same year. I regret picking a 73 because I didn't realize till I got it. The parts are extremely hard to find. I'd much rather would have gotten a 69, a 70, a 72 because the parts are so much easier to find. Like it's very rare. So I feel like it's very unique though. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, if I think back in wrestling, like I can't ever really think of a woman who had a car gimmick like from beginning to end like maybe they tried to toy around with the idea but didn't work out for them because it wasn't a part of them but I feel like this is I mean you said your dad is a mechanic and has been and always loved classic cars so like this is like embedded into the soul of who you are which yes is my works out. wrestling sorry yeah that's exactly what I tell people I'm like my wrestling character is just a bigger superhero turned up version of the character, like who I am as a person, my character, like, yeah, I drive an American muscle car, I do change my own oil. I like going to car shows. It's, it's a real thing. It's a real <laughs> like gimmick or <laughs> whatever. Like I know where I used to live, they used to have classic car shows all the time. And that was like something like, okay, there's nothing else really to do on a Friday night or a Saturday night. Let's go and go to the car show and just, you know, hang out for a bit. But like, I never really got into it. I'm like, oh, okay, those are cool looking cars, but I couldn't tell yeah. you a single solitary thing about one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's great that, that that's your gimmick. Cause like I said, it's so unique to the wrestling business. And then with it being embedded into who you actually are as a person, I think that that just makes it excel so much more for you. Thank right? you. I feel like, yeah, I feel like I bring something to the table um, like I can be a real asset to many companies because that opens doors for me to work with other sponsorships, like advanced auto parts, all, you know, any type of car things. Like I have many ambitions even outside of wrestling. So, you know, it's something like you said, not another female wrestler has ever done before. So. That's awesome. And I mean, you've been training your, what your debut was what 2016, right? Yes. So, I mean, like I said, that hasn't been that long, about five years you've been in the business. You're excelling at a great rate. I mean, you've already had so much national TV exposure and I'm sure once the pandemic's over, hopefully you'll get back out there on that scene again as well. But let's talk about that because in 2017 and 2018, you had eight different matches with Impact Wrestling. How was it working with Yes, Impact? it was amazing. Um, you got to think I was pretty new in the business still. Mm -hmm. And that was my first TV experience and debut and Gail Kim, who I was like crazy about, like, I love you. I, you know, you are one of the females I used to watch. I'm like, ah, oh. and she agent my matches. She was wonderful. I learned so much from her. And, and then all the women I got to wrestle. My first match was with Allie, who's mm -hmm. now in AEW. Um, 
Taya Valkyrie, Sienna, Rosemary, Sue Young. I just, I'm sure I'm leaving a few out, but you said about eight matches. So yeah, I got to work with so many great women and learn from them. And you got to think these are like veterans that have been wrestling. I mean, 10 years or almost 10 years. Like they got a couple of years on me and I'm getting to learn from them. And then impact was so kind, you know, they said, we keep bringing you back because you can obviously hang in the ring with these girls. And it was, it was great. That's phenomenal. Cause like you said, you're only, uh, I think what a year and a half, two years in the business, you're wrestling these girls like Ali, who you said's on AEW, Sienna, also known as Allison K. She's been yeah. on NWA. She's been in the May Young Classic, Taya Valkyrie. I mean, these women have a long <laughs> accolades that you could just go over and over and you're getting the opportunity to learn and work from them. And especially somebody like Gail Kim. I mean, come on, that's amazing. Yeah. Especially that young in your career and TV exposure at the same time to learn and grow must have been just everything for you. Yes. And I felt like, okay, maybe I'm on the right track and things, you know, I guess I'm doing something right. Or they would have been like, get this girl out of here. <laughs> 100%. So, now, did yeah. anybody give you any, any advice when you were there that you took yes. and grew from? Yes, um, I did. I got a lot of learning experiences, TV experience, you know, talking, just everything. It felt good. And it was a very welcomed experience. Awesome. Who was, I mean, this is going out on a limb. You don't have to say if you don't want to, but who was your favorite opponent at NXT when, or not NXT, we'll get to NXT at impact while you were there. Is it hard? Um, to I got so much praise from the match with Allie and that was my first match. Mm -hmm. And she was, uh, just so lovely to work with. Um, Ty Valkyrie was also just learning from these women and they were, like I said, very welcoming. Um, I mean, I'll be honest, I don't, even though like, let's say the outcome of the matches wasn't exactly what I would have wanted and I got my ass kicked. I think I kicked a little ass and gave a tune up myself. Um, I enjoyed working with all the women there. So maybe um, my first few matches in, so like Allie, I just felt like I learned the most because it was like the first experience. Um, yeah. That's phenomenal. I'm glad that, you know, you had those opportunities. And like I said, not, I mean, shortly thereafter, you go back into the independent, obviously you can use what you learned at impact to grow, but then you also made your debut at NXT as well. So, I mean, getting even more national exposure, even more TV exposure, that's just got to like, shoot you out of the like cannon basically <laughs> for any independent scene especially down in Orlando yes my first match with NXT was unexpected and it was just boom out of nowhere and uh Nikki Cross it was great I felt like it was a really good match and I had to showcase quite a bit um and yeah it opened up you know many doors for me just that first match so I was very grateful and then I came back and then I got to wrestle two of the top women from Japan, you know, Io Shirai, Io Shirai Kairi Sane, and then my tag partner was Tanea Brooks, mm -hmm. um, Rebel that's now on AEW. So, I mean, I'm, I'm around all these veteran women. And yeah, and then since then, like, I was in touch uh, with the companies and they, you know, they said to keep doing what I'm doing and then international was good. So in 2019, I went to London, South Africa and Panama within six months. And I was and they were like, good, good. We're watching you. That's great. And then 2020 happened. <laughs> oh, yeah. <2020. laughs> so, a little bit of a slowdown, but, um, you know, everybody's journey is a little different. I got a few more speed bumps in mind till maybe I reach that destination I'm trying to get to. So, but I mean, think of that. I mean, you're not, you're five in five years in now. So before 2020, you're three to four years in you're wrestling on two television shows nationwide, worldwide even, mm -hmm. and then you have worldwide exposure by going to London, South Africa, and Panama. I mean, girl, you're like, it just seemed like before you got to 2020, you're like, you were just <laughs> to use words that you would use, like revving up and, you know, getting ready to yeah. like fall ass, like <laughs> Yeah, I was definitely... I felt like I was cruising in the right direction. So, and <laughs> I love all the car references. 
<laughs> I always try and throw those little like puns in and stuff. And I love when people throw them back at me. I'm like, yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll do I what I can. Be, um, <laughs> no promises. Yeah, I try. <laughs> like, I have been told don't be too like uh, corny with it, like very 80s. Like, don't yeah. be too 80s with it. Like, when you talk and everything, like, be very modern with it. So. <laughs> But oh no, man, I was terrible. When I when I first cut promos, I was so 80s. Like I was like 80s mentality, and it was just whoa, whoa, calm down. <laughs> oh, I totally get it. <laughs> but I mean, the way you say it, like you know, earlier you mentioned, like you know, I went in there and I you know got a tune up or whatever, and I was like, oh, that's like the perfect little fit in without being like completely dramatic and over the top, basically an 80s promo. <laughs> so it's that's good. what I do. I think yeah, I say like. Amount. I did that. Um, so I'm wrestling for shine, um, this Saturday and yes, I'm wrestling for shine this Saturday. It's January 23rd and they're coming back to Port Ritchie, the Tampa area. And they've been gone for about 11, 12 months. You know, they've, I wrestled for them in New York too. They were out and about from Florida to New York, but I'm um, wrestling the ACW women's champion, which is Allie Rex. And I told her how I cut a promo video. I just put it online and shine's been promoting it. Um, actually fight TV just posted it as well. A couple other places. And that's what my gimmick is. Like I'm always like, yeah, I'm going to give you a tune up. And, and one of my signature moves in the ring is called the tune up. Um, my finisher is like the Nova driver. So I got a couple little gimmicky things, but I'm serious. Like when I step in the ring with you, I know we're both competing. You might kick my ass and I'm going to give you a tune up. And that's, that's it <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect and I was actually going to ask you about that because you do I, like I've seen a bunch of your matches and stuff you do have like a very unique offense how do you come up with that I know that you're training all the time because I see your videos and stuff but like how do you come up with the different uh moves that you're coming up with and keeping it fresh in the ring all the time I I watch a lot of wrestling and I like more traditional wrestling. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say I, I really just like grappling, like catch, catch mm -hmm. wrestling. And I like to watch a lot of that because catch wrestling is just, you can go into so many transitions into like pro wrestling. But yeah, I watch a lot. I study a lot. I just try and I don't want to ever be complacent. And then um, I don't always want to be too, um, repetitive for people just know what's going to come next i want to shock the people You're like oh that's different <laughs> yeah, i like i said i've like watched some of your matches i'm like wow i never thought about doing it that way you know or whatever and i'm like it's so unique the things that you're doing so i love it thank so, you one thing that i noticed when i i go through everybody's like instagram and twitter and try to figure out like you know a different aspect of things have you also done karate? Because I noticed that like in some of your pictures, you're in like what looks like a dojo. I um, have not done karate like full oh. on. No, I took a few classes um, at Gracie Barra, which is Brazilian yes. jiu-jitsu. And I was supporting a girlfriend that was there. And um, that's probably a few of the pictures you, you mm -hmm. saw, which I went there and the trainer was so impressed with my knowledge already. Like, triangle choke you know your arm bar like all these rolls and transitions he's like have you done this before you already know like it was just and I'm with the beginners because my girlfriend was trying it and I wanted to support her and she's been getting into it so I'm there to help her and she can work with me which I already know what I'm doing a lot so it'd be easier with her and uh yeah I guess I definitely impressed the trainers so yeah because like I see some of like your promo pictures especially the one that comes to mind is the pink power ranger one you have like these just high kicks that you do <laughs> and I don't know if you can hold that like I know I can do a high kick but like to hold it to take a picture is another question so how did oh my hip that pink power I was so sore the next day <laughs> <laughs> I was so sore so yeah like I do like I can do the jumping kick in the air for the photos and I can do the kick and hold it and honestly like I like to, when I was trained, my trainers helped me with a lot of, I guess, yeah, martial arts were like the side kick, super kick. And it's a lot of like extending your leg and flexing and having to get the right camera angle to make it look good. And like, yeah, my hip hurt pretty bad the next day. I was like, I'm <laughs> sore. I need to stretch. <laughs> so thanks. Um, I have no background in that. Um, 
I mean, I was decently athletic growing up, but no karate background. Yeah. Well, when you were younger, what kind of athletics were you in? I did volleyball. And I think that's how I mainly started working on like abs all the time was volleyball. I used lots of abs. And then uh, I made varsity cheerleading my freshman year, but I didn't stick with it. And I switched high schools because I got bullied a bit. And I was like, oh. I don't know if cheerleading's for me anymore. It kind of killed it for me. And then I moved on. Why were you bullied? Uh, why is any girls bullied? I mean, I had braces. I was, um, then I didn't have braces, but I don't know, skinny. You know, people would uh, call me anorexic or bulimic when I wasn't. I've never have had an eating disorder. My my mom is like 115 pounds and she had five kids. It's just uh, small genes. And, you know, girl, you know, kids, kids are really mean when you're younger. I was bullied oh, terribly. Like, you know, the middle school stages. Yeah. Well, I remember I was bullied a lot because I was a female that liked wrestling. So that's why I was wondering if maybe that was the same with you too. Because like for me... There were some people that made my life hell just because I liked wrestling. And I was like, what's, what's wrong with liking wrestling and being a girl, Right, you know, but no, that wasn't a reason I love, I did love wrestling. Yeah. See, I was wearing my Steve, my Stone Cold Steve Austin shirts and my rock shirts. And people are like, why is she wearing that? Girls don't watch wrestling. And I was like, whatever. Oh uh, yeah. Jeez. The stages of growing up. Yeah. And then high school can be so cruel too. And and like, I can't believe like, kids nowadays, they also have social media to worry about. At least back then, I didn't have to worry yeah. about that. Like once I went home, I could forget about what was going on at school and just go about my own thing, but not anymore for kids. I don't know how they deal with it now. Well, I had Facebook in high school. I don't think Instagram came out yet. Yeah. Um, that was definitely not a thing yet. Or Twitter. I don't know if Twitter was, but I didn't have one. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I barely had a cell phone. Like if I wanted one, I had to pay for my own cell phone in high school. And, and I like, well, you know, if I can't afford it, then mom and dad can't always call me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Back before like cell phones were like, everybody had one. And uh, like, I went to a concert in another state and my mom made me take her cell phone with me so that she could get a hold of me. Cause of course we still had a landline and stuff. So like, that was like how she was like, make sure like everything went okay. Cause like, I'm not talking like I went to the next state over. No, I like drove up the East coast all the way to Maine from Ohio, yeah. like a 12 hour drive. So my mom's like, no, sweetheart, you're going to take my phone. So I know that things are okay. <laughs> that's different. That's, yeah, of course. that's different. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't have a phone either until God knows how old I was. I can't even remember. I'm crazy. Yeah. But like, I just yeah, I think about 10 years ago and how, I mean, we didn't have Zoom meetings like this 10 years ago. We don't c carry computers with us all day long. It's so different. I just like 10 years ago when I was 19, I just had normal, I think I had like a normal, well, there was the iPhone and things like that were coming out. But mm -hmm. even like in high school, I just growing up, I didn't have all this when I was a kid and it's just evolved so much. Oh yeah. And it's crazy how much technology has evolved especially and like you said like zoom meetings now like yeah. two years ago did you think like you'd be sitting at a computer like um well maybe not you for work but like a lot of people have to sit at their computers every day and do zoom meetings like just to work I know yeah it's it's crazy but I mean of course a lot of that's due to the pandemic as well but you know yeah. but actually speaking of technology I saw a ad on tv the other day it was for a dating app but instead of like tinder or like whatever like you would go meet up with somebody it's a virtual dating app so like you could talk like on zoom with them but like there's an app for it that's just for the dating like I thought I was like that's nice wow. I mean honestly with social media if you ever go on a dating app I don't understand why you wouldn't do a video call first before meeting the person just to make sure it's they look like their profile pictures or whatever <laughs> like let's do it let's let's do a video call real quick and just make sure you're you and then we'll, yeah. we'll talk about meeting now and <laughs> going out. Yeah, well, when I met my husband, I mean, iPhones was a, uh, iPhones were around, but like he li obviously lived in Canada. I lived in Ohio. And I mean, we FaceTimed each other all the time. So I guess we didn't need an app, but I mean, that is like brilliant to have like, okay, let's make sure yeah. this person is actually who they say they are before I leave my house and worry about the gazillion things you could worry about going on a blind date with somebody. 
Yes. It was dangerous back when my parents grew up. They didn't they didn't even have map quests. They yeah. didn't print out directions back then. <laughs> well, I'm I'm aging myself, but when I started wrestling, that's how I got to shows. I went to map quests, I printed out <laughs> the directions, and that's how I yeah. got to shows. Thank God GPSs came out because that made life oh. so much easier. Because if oh you, my God. you hit the turn on MapQuest, you were screwed. You have to figure out yeah. how to get back to where you were. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. So <laughs> let's talk because you did mention you have Shine coming up and you've been wrestling during the pandemic as well. How is that for you guys? Because I mean, we were talking prior to coming on and actually doing the interview that it's quite a, quite a bit difference between Florida and what we're what's going on in Canada like we haven't got especially where I'm Quebec where there's not a lot of things even open but you guys still are running shows I mean obviously WWE's there impact well impact's not there impact's in Nashville but you have AEW also there like Mm -hmm. how is it wrestling during the during the pandemic it's different for sure smaller crowds people are spaced out they have masks on so I feel like because they're wearing a mask they're less likely to be loud and like, woo, let's go. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, they're not wanting to engage as much, even with the masks on sometimes. I mean, some of the crowds I've seen have been pretty good, but I mean, Florida is just different even from California. California, their gyms are still not even open. Florida's gyms have been open since last July. Um, and then we just had to maintain the social distancing. And I've done a couple small shows. I went to Texas in October. Uh, that was the first out-of-state booking I did was last October in Texas. Prior to that, I didn't travel since February. I was, let's see, I wrestled in like Arizona, Alabama, Georgia, Texas last January, traveling to LA. Last place I went was LAX Fan Fest in February, the 29th, last show I traveled to. Then the shutdown happened in March. And I didn't travel again until October. Um, and then I just, the yeah, then... Yeah, that I mean, and that, oh, and then when I did go to the airport, yeah, it was just empty. What's funny though is it's very empty, like it's not a lot of people, but when I get on the flight, it's packed. <laughs> oh, that's so bizarre. <laughs> it was still like pretty full on some, yeah, on some of these flights. And that a lot of people are flying because it's cheaper flights right now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a crazy time we're living in right now. With, I mean, and even the gosh, I look back at wrestling and, um, I look back at even just impact wrestling back in, let's say 2001 and thousands of people there, thousands, like the crowd was great. And now it's just, I don't know if there's just so much wrestling out there now that there's just less people interested or it's like anything you have so much of it. It's always at your hand. It's like, nah, you know, that's yeah. being rare. And I don't know. Yeah. It's just, I definitely see there's still hope and there's a lot of passionate fans out there. I think WWE did an excellent job with this Thunderdome, really connecting the people virtually. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that's pretty great. great. Um, I know AEW started letting fans in um, very spaced out in their big stadium there. So, and they're in Jacksonville. So, I mean, it's picking up, but, you know, not much change has happened yet. Is it kind of like, like wrestling, like a custom match because the fans aren't being loud? Like, is it just kind of that? Exactly. Fun? It's, it's so some of the shows I've wrestled on. Yeah. They have been like wrestling a custom match where we're just doing the match, but there's no audience. And yeah, some of it has been like that. I'll say, yeah, it's yeah. Cause for those who don't know, custom matches are when somebody orders a match for you and an, an opponent or anyway, you put together your own wrestling match basically. And then the wrestlers put it together and do it for you usually on camera. And there's no nobody else there except for the camera person, maybe a couple of people just watching. But like you don't have the same, yeah. yeah, you don't have the same adrenaline that you do when you're actually out in front of a crowd. So it makes it a lot harder because like when you yes. take that big bump off off the turnbuckle or something, like there's nobody there to go, <sighs> and that adrenaline, that sound, like it sounds so simple, but it means so much in the aspect of wrestling, especially to the the people that are in the ring at that time it's crazy yeah so like yeah like you were saying custom matches you get to pick my favorite wrestler versus my favorite wrestler and and have a match or I mean I consider it more like training 
yeah then well, a real it's not i don't consider it a real match i don't document them as real matches because yeah. it's not an audience it's not you know like a tv taped thing but it's like a really good training session for matches um but yeah just impact wrestling actually i was watching impact the other night and yeah they have you know no no crowd and it's so quiet that still it seems like just like you said like i feel for them because like i said that adrenaline is something that like i thrived off of when i was wrestling like even though i was 99.9 percent of the time a heel or the bad guy like to have somebody booing me while i'm pulling somebody else's hair that adrenaline gets me going so like when yeah. that case finally does you know get something up on me i'm like I'm in that zone, but without a crowd there, it's so hard. Like I find it so hard to get into a zone. Is that the same for you? Um, it hasn't been too much. No, because I've actually had people, even if it's not a lot of people, like I went and wrestled at hurricane pro, uh, in October, I'm going to go wrestle again in Texas. Like, and then this Saturday at shine, like they're going to have people, not a ton of people, but we're right. going to have a good amount of people that can still, you know, hopefully make the building as loud as possible. And I see a lot of fans out there very excited to attend shine again. So I feel like it's gonna be a good crowd. Yeah. Shine is great for women's professional wrestling. Like I haven't been there in several years, but I mean, I loved it. It was something else. Like back in the day, people would ask me like, Oh, you know, what's your favorite promotion to wrestle for WSU shimmer shine or whatever. And I'm like, well, it's kind of like apples and oranges. It's all professional wrestling, but like you get different flavors everywhere. And Shine was something where it had that kind of mix of hardcore where you wouldn't quite see it at Shimmer. And, you know, it was more like technical wrestling, whereas not as much as WSU. So like it was a nice mix of everything. But I mean, I digress. Those, those yeah. promotion, uh, some of those promotions have changed quite a bit since then, so. But, you know, yes. that's, that's life. You change and everything happens. It's a lot of timing. You know, I used to always think, oh, timing, sure. But it really is a lot about timing. Mm -hmm. um, Ten years ago, women's wrestling was a lot different than it is now. Oh, man. Like, <laughs> ten years ago, I was, pro I was like, three or four years in at that time. And there was, there was a lot of women, but not like there is now with the women's revolution that came out with uh, Sasha and Bailey and, yeah. and Becky Lynch and Charlotte and everybody there. Like it has exploded. Like I haven't wrestled in quite a, like three years, but like I try to keep my, my feelers out there and see like who's on the independent scene, who's up and coming and stuff like that. And like, I can't believe like how many amazing- There's so many women. Yeah, there's so many women. There's like my only thing is like I just hope now. Yeah, I just hope that the young women coming up and guys like I know everyone's really eager to be a professional wrestler because they see it's possible. Just I hope they get the proper training before they mm -hmm. just jump on wrestling shows. I see that too often where women or young guys are just they're jumping on shows faster than they're getting their proper training. Like me, I was like I don't want to have a match yet. I'm not ready. And they're like, you're ready. I'm like, no, I'm not. And they were like, you're. I had to get pushed through the door <laughs> to really because I was like let me train some more they're like you're ready yeah I was so I'm way. like I'm more of that kind of person where I see these younger people are so confident where I'm like hey I know you're really confident that's good to have but not to be rude you need more training like you shouldn't be too confident because do you want do you want 50 terrible YouTube matches out there about you mm -hmm. and that's what they see your work as or do you want five really good wrestling YouTube matches out there about you and then they can see you can work yeah, definitely. And that's what I try to tell these young kids like that are getting in that I'm like, you know, that's that's how you got to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for being only five years in, that's like a really great outlook to have already. Like, I'm surprised, you know, <laughs> a lot of people do. They want to go out and jump in the ring yeah. as quickly as possible. But like like you said, I was the same way when my trainer was like, OK, your first match is in like three weeks. I was like, no, no, no. It's not. <laughs> he's like, yeah, you're ready. I'm like. Uh, I don't know about that, but then I ended up having a fine match and everything went well. And obviously everything went well after that as well. So I can't, I, I think he, he was on the right track. Whereas I was just nervous. Like I remember the day of my first match, I was like in my hotel room, like ready to throw up, like, okay, <laughs> I don't want to be too early to the show, but I know I got to go help set up the ring and everything, but I'm going to vomit. <laughs> like, no. I never did, 
luckily, but I was so nervous. I was, I felt like I was going to vomit and just uh, stink up the place is what I thought I was going to do. But luckily I had a veteran in the ring with me and she took care of me. So, oh, do you remember your first match? I do. And I was very nervous and intimidated. And I think I trained for about like eight months because I had to take some time off. I ended up getting like bronchitis. It was my first year moving here. I was just trying to settle in on my own and uh yeah about eight months training or so and but I got really good feedback from it awesome. and mom and dad were there for it too so that was nice oh my mom was there for mine too that's one of my one of my favorite pictures ever is my mom and me at my first match she's like just over my shoulder like kind of giving me like this hug from behind and it's adorable my favorite picture mm. but yeah, my parents have always been supportive. My dad, biggest supporter with the wrestling. My mom, she was just like, don't get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. Because even when I told my mom, I was like, mom, I'm going to go train to be a wrestler. She's like, okay. Thinking it was going to be like something that lasted like, you know, six months or something. And then I was yeah. gonna tired to move on. And then I just stayed with yeah. him. But she was always there. Like, it was hard. I don't know. Maybe your mom and dad's like this too. Having your parents, well, have you ever been heel? Because I mean, I've only ever seen you as a baby face. What? My first match, I was heel. <laughs> I was oh, heel really? my first, oh like, that's so hard to do. My first two or three years, I was vicious, girl, and I was smart. I, 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 you know what I said? I pulled out any tools in my box I had to to try and win against these veterans, and I would <laughs> choke them with my wrench, and I'd hide little wrenches in my boots and try to hit people with them. That's so, awesome. I'm gonna have to go back and try to find. <laughs> yeah. But I know you as like just this cute little baby face. But like, okay, so as a heel and your parents coming, did your parents still cheer you even though you were a heel? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's like the worst. I'm like, Ma, I was always like, mom, yeah, I'm yeah. my job if you're cheering for me. Yeah, well, you know, so that's what they say. Like you want to tell them to, to boo you or whatever. But then sometimes it's like, well, it's okay if you got one or two people in the crowd that are like, hey, yeah. you know, I mean, how many heels are there? Like, you know, growing up, like, that you people would still cheer for even though they're not really the good guy <laughs> yes 100 i'm thinking of like well let's see stone cold i think was pretty yeah. baby face if you ask me well I mean, he or- first. <laughs> the crowd yeah baby face. um the rock you know people couldn't help but like him it's very true it does it does happen there are some heels that are just overwhelmingly loved by by their crowd and everything and that you can't help but turn them basically baby face at that time <laughs> right so let's talk more about you because there's still some things that I have here in my notes that I want to talk to you about I mean obviously you mentioned earlier with the volleyball that's where you started with your abs what is your <laughs> routine like because I mean you said you have good genes because your mother's small and everything like that but I mean you're pretty ripped so what is a daily routine for you um so daily routine would have to go back when I was an EMT I used to have like an ab wheel I used that but my partner was a fireman that I also went to high school with it's like all right you're shredded what do you do give me the the tips so he's like come here sit on the edge of this bench just Mm -hmm. leg raises he's like you can sit on the edge of your bed you can sit on the floor you know your tailbone so I recommend the edge of the bed or the couch or the chair it's a little softer than the floor but the floor is fine and you do leg raises and you just hold your legs elevated and keep your core really tight about no more than like six inches off the ground. And then you do one leg at a time. You do both legs at a time. I would do, man, I would do three, 400 a day, about four wow. days a week. And I would just nonstop do them. And then to the point where I could do them like once a week and I'd be fine. Or, you know, two, three times a week and be fine. Um, I also do like, you know, you can do leg raises even like in a, like if you got the pull-up bar, mm-hmm. you can do leg raises with the pull-up bar or those um, more comfortable machines where you can lean back pull-up bars where they have the padding and everything you can rest yourself here and then do them I got a couple videos on my Instagram but fans do ask me often and I'm like well should I just start like an Instagram page it's just like amber abs and just like only ab workouts on this Instagram page (laughs) I I don't know your first follower (laughs) I mean I have a few videos yeah I could just give it a, a whirl and just connect it to my profile and and show people some, I mean, it's, it's brutal and it's really tough. Um, but it does strengthen you and your core. Like I always, when I do my workouts and I go to the gym, I always like to start with abs first. I also, um, have been doing hot yoga for like the last four years mm-hmm. and hot yoga does a lot of abs, arms, 
legs. I mean, it's a whole core body workout, but it's just your body. And the stretching is good and everything. So, all right, maybe Amber abs page coming soon. <laughs> hey, that's smart. Even make it a YouTube channel and maybe you could branch out like and start making money off that as well. I mean, who knows? It's a good idea. People have been asking me, yeah. So my last question that, before we wrap it up is, you have so many different merch ideas. Do you come up with your own merch or do you have like somebody else that comes up with ideas and like kind of pitches them to you? No, that was um, my idea. Any of my merchandise, um, I do like the airbrushed spray painted trucker hats. And then my first match moment, well, even my first few years, I was wrestling in just jeans and had a grease rag in my back pocket and just a sports bra tank top that I you know, airbrushed hot orange with tire marks and wrenches. And so, yeah, like the grease rags that is bought, like bulks of grease rags. And I, I actually handmade each grease rag and I spray painted tire marks and wrenches on it, my name. Um, I was trying to think of other uh, tools that I could sell. Like, oh, I don't know. Should I sell wrenches? <laughs> Maybe not. Hey, why not? But um, <laughs> I don't know. Here's a weapon. Here's a weapon. Just give all oh, the fans a bunch true. of weapons at the show. <laughs> No, I think the hats are cool. The grease rags, you know, I got posters, t-shirts. Um, I really had, I've, I've always wanted to model and it's like always something I wanted to do growing up, but it, you know, I'm shorter, so it's harder, but I look tall yeah. in photos. So I've, I've had a lot of fun modeling and I'm trying to get into more catalog kind of modeling being, I'm not super like runway tall. I just look tall in photos. People say, but oh, I have to say okay. like, Different yeah, I just, you look taller. Yeah, exactly. And I have to say, I'm just so grateful that I've gotten to go after these passions. And that's why I really tell people about having that drive, having that passion. It takes a lot of courage, but I mean, I've gotten to do such amazing work that, you know, I just used to dream about six years mm -hmm. ago. And now, I mean, you know, I feel like everyone should always take a step back, breathe, respect your mental health and just what are you grateful for if that? I think that one question, that one sentence, what are you grateful for really can help reset people in their mind. Cause you know, times are hard and we take things for granted. Obviously everyone woke up in 2020 like, wow, we take a lot for granted. Never thought yeah. we'd ever get shut down. So yeah. Awesome. And I think, that, <laughs> I think that's a great way to end with like that little emotional or not emotional, but inspirational moment there. But before we go, let's tell everybody all of your social media and where they can find you next. So, um, yeah, what's next for Amber Nova? It'll be this January 23rd. This You guys can check it out probably afterwards on the WWN Live Network or Fight TV. But I'm going to be back shifting gears with Shine Wrestling. Then I'm off to Texas for SWE February 6th. So I got some things coming along. And you can check out my social media. Follow me on AmberNova73 on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. The 73 is for the year of my car. I was not born in that year. Yes, it has been asked many times. And oh, <laughs> That's crazy. And uh, yeah, if you're not familiar with me, YouTube my matches. Uh, check out some of my matches, Amber Nova. If you want to get geared up with me, just send me an email or DM. We got grease rags and t-shirts, hats, posters, photos. So yeah, get geared up with me. Awesome. I think it's insane that people think that you were born in 73. Yeah. I'm like, I don't think I got those many wrinkles just yet. <laughs> no, you have zero. Give me a break. All right. Amber, <laughs> it has been such a pleasure having you on and I can't wait to see what the future holds for you. Thanks, girlfriend. Hey guys, help me welcome pro wrestling historian and author Dan Murphy. Hey, Dan. Hey, Steph. Thanks for having me back. How are things going? Good. How's things with you? Really good. Uh, here in Buffalo, New York, got about a foot of snow last night. So everything's shoveled out and we're uh, bracing until the next snowfall comes. But right now, everything's nice and cozy, I guess. So doing well. And speaking of cozy, I noticed that nice new plaque there behind you. Oh, you see that? Yeah, it, it really kind of brightens up the room. Uh, that's the cover of my next book that's coming out in April, uh, The Wrestlers, Wrestlers, The Masters of the Craft of Professional Wrestling. And you'll get a kick out of this. Uh, my co-author, Brian Young, got me that as a gift. Um, and what he said when he gave it to me, it's it's this nice kind of screen print, uh, you know, for suitable for hanging. It says, next time you're on Talking Sass, I want to see that hanging over your shoulder. 
So he specifically had it made for this podcast. So that's awesome. There well, it is. Thank him so much because that's awesome. I'm glad that you could put that out there in the world. And it's here on Talking Sass now every time we have you on. There we go. Yeah. And available for pre-order right now. And uh, with ECW Press, Amazon, The Wrestlers, Wrestlers comes out in April. Yes. Make sure you guys go and pre-order that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you have on, on deck for us tonight? Well, I was thinking, okay, I wanted to come up with a couple of uh, women's wrestling historical notes from February in the past. And uh, we've all heard about Evolution, WWE's women's pay-per-view in, in 2018. And I thought back, you know, there were several other women's pay-per-views as much as WWE billed that as being the first women's pay-per-view. TNA, Impact had done a few. But even before that, there were two, and both of them took place in February. So I thought those would be nice to take a look at. So uh, the first one, 1992, it was the LPWA, the, uh, the Ladies Professional Wrestling Association, the Super Ladies Showdown. Uh, took place on February 23rd, 1992. Uh, had about a dozen matches on the card, 12 matches altogether. Uh, main event, let me see here, according to my notes, Yes, it was Terry Power against Lady X, which is Peggy Lee Leather in a mask. Um, so that one took place in 92 in Rochester, Minnesota, drew about 400 people or so. It was really the LPWA's attempt to make a big splash. And uh, they did, on top of that, uh, Reggie Bennett was on the card. Uh, you had the Glamour Girls, you know, about 14 years removed from their run as WWF Tag Team Champions, but they were on the card and they did a tournament to name the uh, LPW's, LPWA's Japanese women's champion on the show as well. So they brought in some Joshi stars. So it was a really loaded card and it bombed. It just didn't do well. The time wasn't right. But if you think about it, uh, you had Terry Power winning in the main event. Terry Power would go on six years later to become Tori in WWE. Uh, so she had a, a career ahead of her. She was very green, but she had the star quality and she was in that main event. Uh, so they definitely had something good with her. They had the Joshis on the card, which nobody else was showing. And if you think about it, 1992, the WWF's women's title was on uh, hiatus. There was nobody holding that championship. So the LPWA kind of stepped in there at a time where women's wrestling was not being shown in the U.S. at all, ran a pay-per-view, and it ended up kind of ending the company because it didn't get picked up. It didn't have legs beyond that. But it did really kind of, it stands alone. You can still watch it. You know, if you watch it today, a lot of the matches actually do hold up. I've Another one. I've seen that one, though. I will definitely you have to seen check that? that one out. No, I've never heard of it even. So I'm going to yeah. write that down and check it out. Uh, Harley Saito was in the match. She won the, the LPWA Women's, uh, Japan Women's Championship. Uh, I mentioned Reggie Bennett. Uh, Terry Power was very, very talented. She was just, at that point, kind of a power lifter. Um, but she had the look and the charisma. She was still pretty green, but she really had this kind of um, young John Cena type of thing where she just had that fantastic build and that innate star power. And it's just a shame that by the time she got to WWE six years later, they kind of softened her look, softened everything up and took away that edge that really made her special at that LPWA show. Then the other one, was in 2001, February 4th. And uh, this one, I'm sure you've heard of, the Women of Wrestling. Of course. Do you remember the, uh, yeah. no, you, have, you, uh, have you been involved with the Women of Wrestling at all? Or have I you have not. Things? I always wanted to, just because of the whole history and everything with it, but never, never got to be a part of it, sadly. Okay. Well, this was their uh, first pay-per-view, Unleashed, uh, February 4th. Um, and in, in, in 2001, the interesting thing about this, it was in Los Angeles, and they actually got 9,500 fans in the building for this. Amazing. Only about three or 400 paid. Oh. Uh, they opened the doors up and papered the heck out of this place um, because they really, really wanted this to look good on pay-per-view. Um, it was David McLean. He had done the Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling, had done Glow about 15 years earlier, and he tried to do the same thing with the original WOW it was all kind of gimmicky characters, mm -hmm. very campy. Most of the matches went three or four minutes, which is kind of what WWE was doing at that time too. Yeah. You're, you're coming right out of the, the brawn panties era and before, well, that's right around Ivory and uh, China at, at that era. 
Um, but again, that ended up having uh, Bambi versus Peggy Lee, Le- Peggy Lee Leather in the main event. Uh, it was Selena Majors and The Thug is the names that they used in that in a steel cage. And that was a terrific match. Uh, the rest of the show, a lot of gimmicks. They did a bikini contest and typical stuff for the era. Um, but they did run this. It, it was the biggest house in terms of attendance, not paid attendance, of any non-WWE or WCW show in that decade. That's amazing. Not Ring of Honor, not Impact. It was 9,500 people. They were busing people into this, even though it was almost a completely papered house. And again, because it didn't draw, it only did about 4,000 buys on pay-per-view. It didn't, they ended up sidelining W uh, Women's Wrestling WoW uh, from there for about 11 years until 2012. So it didn't take off, but again, it did show that there were other companies that were out there trying to put women on a pay-per-view uh, level uh, well before TNA, Impact, and uh, WWE. Amazing. It's crazy because, like, there were, like, other, like, I mean, once you get into Shimmer and right probably around, I would, let's say 2010-ish, so about 11 years ago, when the internet pay-per-views came out. I mean, then yes. you were having women on these pay-per-views all the time. And now I don't know what the buy rates actually were, but I mean, from what they were telling us and what I was seeing on my social media after I would have a match was, you know, great. I mean, could it have been just five people? Maybe, (laughs) but you never know, you know? Yeah, the entire entire model changed. And and that was the thing that some of the companies were able to uh, to, to make the transition to internet and, and web pay-per-views and everything. Others were more dialed into the traditional mm-hmm. pay-per-view carriers uh, like David McLean and, and others. And they kind of lived and died by the, the pay-per-views. And when the web pay-per-views and things like Shimmer, where their model was just selling DVDs and, and mm-hmm. subsisting on DVD sales, those kind of uh, proved to be a, a more durable and long-lasting model than the pay-per-view model. Definitely. I know uh, recently, I think I saw Alice in Danger post and maybe it was on the Shimmer uh, Twitter as well. I didn't, or Instagram, I didn't see it, but uh, they still make their, their collectible DVDs for people to purchase all the time. So that's not dead yet. Yeah. No, no. And I, I see that too. A lot of people are asking when the, you know, they're, they're a couple of years behind, I think maybe, yeah. I mean, it takes a while to turn around good product and, and uh, in terms of the DVD production and everything, but the fans, as soon as one's released, they, they jump on it. They are collectibles and they love it. So that's a, it's a model that still works for that audience. Yeah. And I know there's definitely a lot of volumes that are sold out completely. Like you can't find them except for in these collections that people have. That's like I right. believe the, the original shimmer episode one, I believe I have that. And I know people have been asking for that for quite some time, but mine, I actually got, before I think it was even before I was training maybe maybe like slightly right before I went to a ring of honor show and I met Allison Danger and Daisy Hayes and I bought it off of them and both of them actually autographed it really yeah interesting so. thing around that time I had contacted when I was with pro wrestling illustrated mm-hmm. contacted Dave Prezak and uh, wanted some uh, information on shimmer you know I want to mm-hmm. what can you send me uh, you know I want to review anything see what we can write about in the magazine he sent me maybe eight or nine DVDs and I watched them all. And it was enough for me to really say, you know, something there is enough here uh, to go back to Stu Sachs, my publisher and end up making the case for the PWI female 50 and eventually the women's 100. I was able to take those DVDs and say, look at these women, look at the talent that they have at this one little show. There is enough talent that we can actually do a ranking like the 500 for women and he did green light it. And that was because of those shimmer DVDs that Dave sent. Well, that's, that's outstanding history. Cause I was a part of that being were, on PWI absolutely. top 50. I don't know, I think three or four times. And I, I have them all frames and everything. My mom was, that was like one of her like favoriteest things was going to the store and she'd even be in the checkout line. Like, look, this is my daughter. It's right that's here. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so those, those PWI rankings for some people are just they mean so much, you know, just yeah. shows the hard work and determination you put in there. And especially now, I mean, of course they had to update it to the 100 because there's just so many women just doing amazing things on the independent scene. But I mean, think about the companies that you have on TV that get all of this exposure and you still have independent women that are making their name in between all of those 
women that are on international television. So that's amazing. Thank you yeah. for that, definitely. Oh, no problem. And one last thing, mm -hmm. just because of uh, I, it's you and I see what's up on the wall behind you. February 8th, 1958, in New Orleans, Louisiana, Sherry Russell was born, mm -hmm. otherwise Sherry Martell. So this month would, would have been her birthday. She would have been, I believe. I think 63. 60, 63, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I saw everybody, like not everybody, but a few people when they see Sensational Sherry stuff, they always tag me in it. And on her birthday every year, I have a select couple of people who always send me those things. Like it's Sherry's birthday. I'm like, yeah, I know. When and I was, also the day that she passes, I get a lot of people that send me some stuff to you. It, it, it stunned me when I was looking at it earlier and, and trying to do the math and thinking, oh my God, Sherry Martell would have been 63. Like, it, it seems crazy. She's, you know, she's yeah. always Sherry, like the images behind you. She seems like she, you know, that's, that's what she was. And that's what she'll always be. I can never imagine her being 63. Yeah. Uh, well, I remember when I had Rob Schomberger on, of course, this is a Rob Schomberger here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, you know, I look at this picture and like, I see the attitude that she portrays without seeing the motion of everything. Cause obviously it's a painting, right? I was like, but the look on her face that you painted, it conveys the moment. And like, I know the picture that this is from too as well. And I'm like, it's just amazing. He's like, I'm so glad you said that because that's what I want. I want people to feel the emotion of the painting when they see it. And I was like, oh, that's awesome that I, <laughs> that I said that. And that's what you want to be portrayed, you know? So that's that was it. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. And he does, he does amazing work. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years ago, one of the cauliflower alley club reunions uh, in the, the gimmick room, basically where for three or four days, you have all the merchants and things. Uh, he did a painting over the course of three days and it started with just a blank piece, some dabs of color, dabs of color, dabs of color. And by the end of three days, it was Mr. Perfect Kurt Hennig. And it was amazing but to be able to see it developing over the course of three days was just fantastic uh, an incredible talent he does that also at wrestlemania access as well and i've seen him several times there and like he starts the beginning of access with just an idea like you said a blank a blank uh canvas and then he just goes and works over it the next couple of days and it just turns out to be this masterpiece at the end i I wish I had a talent like he does for art. Unfortunately, stick figures are about as good as you get from me. <laughs> and I'll be, we can't all be master artists. So. That's true. That's true. All right, Dan. Well, thank you so much for being a part of the episode again today. We always love our monthly history lessons, especially when we get to talk about other history like shimmer and everything as well. So and there we go. Guys. There we go. Well, thank you very much. Stay warm, stay out of the snow, and I'll see you next month. All right. Sounds good. Bye, Dan. Bye, guys. This has been Talking Sack.